All right, remember our boy Louis the 14th of France with a sweet butt cut and how he was all like, I am the state? So he was the template for absolutist rulers in the 18th century, but later in the century, a new kind of absolutist ruler would emerge, namely the enlightened absolutist. And so in this video, I reckon we ought to talk about it. So if you're ready to get them brain gals milked, absolutely, then let's get to it. So let's start as is proper with a definition. Enlightened absolutism describes 18th century monarchs who wanted to retain absolute power, but also aim to shape and temper the exercise of that power by enlightenment ideals. And by the way, if you want notes to follow along, with this video, then get your clicky finger out and head down to the link in the description. And many of the most significant philosophers were surprisingly down with this. I mean, because royal absolutism was basically a given among several states of the 18th century, the philosophers understood that it really wasn't going away. Therefore, according to their beliefs, the best way Enlightenment ideals could shape politics is through a powerful monarch who embodied those ideas. And the three rulers who most exemplified this new conception of power were Frederick II of Prussia, Catherine II of Russia, and Joseph II of Austria. And let me introduce you to each of them. First, let me introduce you to Frederick II of Prussia, also known as Frederick the Great. Now, he inherited a powerful army from his father's reign, and when you have a powerful army as an absolutist ruler, it's hard not to start thinking to yourself, sure it would be nice to kill a bunch of people and take some land. Yeah, let's do that. So, one of Frederick's first acts was to expand his territory in the style of the absolutists of old. And so he immediately seized the Habsburg territory of Silesia in the War of Austrian Succession, which doubled Prussia's population and significantly increased its power. Well, that doesn't sound very enlightened to me. Just wait for it. But after such a slight, Maria Theresa, the Habsburg ruler of Austria, from whom Frederick took Silesia was all like, nah, um, bruh. Therefore, she allied with France and Russia not only to gain Silesia back, but to conquer the whole dang Prussian territory entirely. And this became one conflict in the larger Seven Years' War, which we'll talk more about in Unit 5. Anyway, Frederick the Great was besieged on all sides and was only saved when a change in power occurred in Russia, namely Peter III, who called off the attack against Prussia. Now, everything I've said so far just indicates that Frederick was an absolutist, not an enlightened absolutist. So let me tell you how that change occurred. The great struggle that Frederick endured during the Seven Years' War led him to consider a new kind of rule tempered by more humane policies informed by Enlightenment thought. In fact, if you compare Louis XIV's assessment of his own power, namely, I am the state, with Frederick's new assessment of his power, namely, I am the first servant of the state, you can clearly see the transition. Additionally, Frederick took pains to justify his rule not by the divine right of kings, but rather by implementing policies that improve the lives of his subjects. So let's have a look at Frederick's more enlightened policies. First was the enactment of greater religious toleration. As a non-believer himself, Frederick tolerated all faiths in his kingdom. However, he did seem to favor Protestants over Jews and Catholics when it came time to appoint people to state bureaucratic positions. Even so, he upheld the importance, for example, of the Catholic Jesuits as educators in Prussia and granted an unheard of degree of freedom for Jews, on which more in a moment. Second, Frederick instigated legal reforms. He led the effort to simplify Prussia's complex set of laws and abolish torture as a legitimate means of punishment. Third, Frederick engaged in bureaucratic reform, and for that he adopted the German principles of cameralism. These principles argued that, yes, monarchy is the most effective form of government, and thus all elements of the state and society ought to be subservient to the monarch. However, the state had the responsibility ability not to be a power-hungry turd and instead use its power for the betterment of society. All right, that was fun, but now let's see how enlightened absolutism is shaping up over in Russia. And for that, let me introduce you to Catherine II, also known as Catherine the Great. So Catherine married Peter III, who was the same guy that I mentioned before who saved Frederick the Great's hind parts in the Seven Year War. But Catherine wasn't interested in being the wife of a monarch. She wanted to be the monarch. In fact, when she wrote her memoir, she said it plain. I did not care about Peter, but I did care about the crown. <laughs> Ooh, that's cold. So she went ahead and hatched a plot to get her husband murdered and thus became Russia's ruler. And even though she murdered her way into power, her education was replete with Enlightenment ideals which informed her three major goals. First, she aimed to continue Peter the Great's efforts to westernize Russia. To that end, she patronized philosophes, of whom Voltaire was her favorite thinker. And she also paid for Diderot's encyclopedia to be published in Russia after it came under the censorship of the French government. And additionally, she imported Western architects and artists into Russia. And second, she enacted legal reform. And to that end, she allowed limited religious tolerance and, like Frederick II, outlawed torture in Russia. Her third goal centered around territorial expansion, and the most significant expansion she participated in was the partition of Poland, which we talked about in the last unit. If you forgot, this was an agreement to divide the entirety of Polish territory between Prussia, Austria, and Russia. So, you know, she was pretty enlightened, but there was a significant limit to her enlightened absolutism, and that came in the Pugachev Rebellion. Now, one of the most enlightened moves an enlightened monarch could make during this period was to emancipate the serfs, which were those lower-class citizens who had worked the land of the nobles and were, in practice, little different from slaves. But in 1773, a soldier named Emilian Pugachev rose up and gathered a ragtag army of serfs. He summarily proclaimed himself the true Tsar of Russia and abolished serfdom. But unfortunately for Pugachev, his untrained militia was crushed by Catherine's army, which was led by nobles. And so after executing Pugachev, any intentions Catherine had about reforming the institution of serfdom were gone, and she even increased their oppression. Okay, now Joseph II of Austria was another enlightened absolutist who sought reforms in his state. To this end, he enacted several royal decrees, which included the following. First, he signed 
ratified the Edict of Toleration, which granted religious freedom for Jews and other religious minorities. Second, he increased the freedom of the press. And third, he put strictures on the power of the Catholic Church. And hey, all that was pretty enlightened, but unfortunately for Joseph, he enacted these reforms real fast without consulting the nobility or the clergy, and because they got a little saucy about it, Joseph's reforms led to significant domestic turmoil during his reign. Now, as you have hopefully witnessed by now, one of the chief markers of enlightened absolutism was an effort towards religious toleration. But one religious group can serve as a test case for the limits of that toleration, namely the Jews. In many European states of the 18th century, Jews were significantly marginalized by law. But with a rising environment of religious toleration engendered by the Enlightenment, a Jewish Enlightenment movement called Haskalah also emerged. And their argument was that the widespread religious intolerance of the Jews was unfitting for the enlightened atmosphere in Europe. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Joseph II of Austria most fully embraced the call for Jewish freedom. Among his reforms were laws allowing Jews to serve in the military or to enter higher education and abolishing the distinguishing symbols that Jews were made to wear. But Frederick the Great and Catherine the Great, despite their impulses towards religious toleration, rejected any easing of anti-Jewish policies in their state. In fact, after Catherine acquired the large Jewish population of Poland after the partition, she created a separate district in which all Jews were required to live. Alright, click here to keep reviewing Unit 4, and since we're at the end of a unit, you are most likely getting ready for an exam. So you can click right here to grab my AP Euro Review Pack, which will help you get an A in your class and a 5 on your exam in May. And I'll catch you on the flip-flop. I'm Lur out.